Good. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, warm welcome to uh, Berlinale Talents. Warm welcome to Valentine's Day. Yay! <laughs> so, and we we uh, try to have the uh, the atmosphere of the Valentine's Day and of the marriage and of the getting together here also within this session. But this session that we do together with uh, Creative Europe Media uh, is also part or under the umbrella of the Producers' Day. But uh, don't leave if you're not a producer because the idea of the Producers' Day is also to tackle issues that are in production and uh, include all the different fields of work and also tackle different topics uh, apart from financing and all those regular stuff. And I don't want to go into detail with this lovely uh, people here. Um, it's about uh, the, for the moderator to tell this, but I just wanted to say uh, great that you are here and great that you are involved, hopefully, in the session because this house, this uh, theater is meant to be the interactive stage where we go into details but we want to go into details together with you. So don't be shy and don't uh, feel yourself as an audience only, also as a contributor, it's very much welcome. Without any further ado, uh, I wish you a pleasant, pleasant um, half, uh, one and a half hours with Toby and the panelists. <laughs> Thank you, Florian. Thank you, Florian. Uh, my name is Toby Ashraf, I'm going to moderate this, but I hope I'm not going to moderate too much, but you're going to moderate yourselves. Vinka just said, like, I have questions for the audience, and I hope you have questions for the panel, and I hope that, you know, furthering what Florian just said, that this is not going to be you just listening or watching a film, which is a panel, but that we get into a conversation amongst yourselves with each other very quickly. Um, before I introduce them in great length, uh, Please welcome Isabel Schuber, Jocelyn Barnes, Winka Wiedemann, and Anna Serna. And instead of, and we talked about this also, like, you know, there are so many facts and figures, and instead of presenting them, I want to ask questions. And the questions are, we are here at a festival, a so-called A-List festival, what is always done when it comes to gender and equality. Um, we look at the competition, we look at how many films are actually directed by women. This is a good thing, but um, we never see that there is something like an equality of 50% in A-list festivals um, that we could have. And whenever it's more than 10 or even 20%, it's been a great year for women. Now, um, if we go back to gender studies or this old trick of like changing woman with man, and we would read a headline that, oh wow, it's been a great year for men because more than 10% of the films are actually um, made by men, we see how ridiculous that is. But why do we only look at the directors? Why don't we also look at the producers? Why don't we look at the festival, um, at the competition films and see how many films are produced, co-produced, executive produced by women? Why don't we look at the actors, like how many films actually have strong female leads? Um, how much screen time do they have? How much dialogue do they have? Do they take uh, pass the Bechdel test? Meaning, is there more than two female characters? Do they both have a name? Do they talk to each other? And do they talk about anything else than men? Um, what kind of uh, what kind of representations do we have in that respect? You know, are we talking when we talk about women? Do we talk about white women? Do we talk about black women? Do we talk about heterosexual women? Do we talk about able-bodied women? Do we talk what kind of bodies are we talking about? These are all you know. I'm just asking a lot of questions, so maybe some of them will stick in your head. Um, going on, why do we only look at the competition? We have so many sections here. We have Generation, and there's a lot of women directors at Generation. There's Forum. There's Tele there's Berlin on the Shorts, there's culinary cinema, there's native cinema. You know, there are so many different sections that we could also look at. We also can look inside the festival, how many festivals are actually directed by women and run by women. Who are the people working at the festival? Who are the people working in the commission? So who's actually selecting the films? So can we at one point say my film as a female filmmaker wasn't accepted because the commission is completely male dominated? All these questions that you might have answers or might not have answers to that, you know, might give us a little bit of introspection. Funding, of course, why is my film not funded? Does it have anything to do with the fact with my gender? Who, is, who sits in the commissions of the fundings? Um, and also, if we leave this bubble of the festival, what happens with the film later? Your film, Isabel Schuber, um, you were lucky enough to have a distribution, so there was a broader audience in Germany and around the world to see it, but so many films 
go from festival to festival and never get a distribution. So, you know, what, what, um, what kind of gender imbalance do we have maybe in distribution structures and so on and so forth. Um, I think we already have um, a lot covered, but then also maybe film schools is a thing that we could cover and see how many film schools are actually directed by women, how many, um, what's the gender imbalance or quality of the students applying, leaving, producing films, and so on and so forth. I think I'm going to stop here now, um, just to give you a broad mind map or main um, brainstorm of, of what we can talk about when we talk about gender equality or inequality. Isabel Schuber is um, sitting to my left. Um, many of you might know her. She is um, she's a director at one of the two major film schools, the one in Potsdam, the Babelsberg Film University, and um, has studied there as a filmmaker and has made her a theoretical master about female roles in a male-dominated film industry. In 2012, she was invited to the Cannes Film Festival with a film called Chica XX Mujer. It was the year that no single woman director was um, present at the Cannes Film Festival, and there was a protest um, called um, Men Are Showing Their Films and Women Showing Their Faces. Isabel Schuba decided to have an actor play Isabel Schuba. So there was an actor going as Isabel Schuba to the festival. <laughs> Isabel Schuba was filming this actor. No one knew, and she made a film out of it called um, Men Are Showing Their Films and Women Are Showing Their Breasts. And that film got screened and got a distribution. And um, yeah, this is where we are at now. And she also has started a mentoring program called Into the Wild that is, um, she's going to tell us more about. That is, she got, I think, most of the film schools or all of the film schools in Germany together to have a, a support mentoring program for female filmmakers in Germany. Isabel Schuber, applause. <laughs> We have uh, Jocelyn Barnes here. She is a, a writer and a producer, also a director of a short film called Prana. Uh, most importantly, she's the co-founder of um, a production company called Louverture Films. Um, the description of it is so good that I cannot paraphrase it, but I'm just going to read it. Louverture Films produces independent films of historical relevance, social purpose, com commercial value, and artistic integrity. Louverture Films partners with progressive filmmakers and producers around the world, and particularly from the global south, and proactively supports the employment and training of cast and crew from communities of color in the United States. Um, her name is associated with such projects at, as the Black Power mixtapes concerning violence, um, the films by Apichat Pongvera Sitaku, like Uncle Bomé, and she has two films here at the Berlinale, Strong Island and um, The House in the Fields, um, that are both featured in the forum and the panorama section. Please give a big welcome to Jocelyn Bruns. <laughs> Linka Wiedemann has many credits in the film industry. She's trained in that and has credits as a producer, as an editor, as a screenwriter, as an artistic manager, and as a film consultant. Um, she is currently, or since 2013, the rector of the National Film School in Denmark. And she has been closely collaborating with um, such directors as Lars von Trier, Thomas Winterberg, and Susanne Bier, and also, of course, Centropa, then, this production company. Um, film titles you might associate her with is uh, Love is All You Need or Melancholia, and of course, uh, Nymphomaniac, where she was the script consultant or film consultant over that, I think, which gives us a great opportunity to talk about female representation in film. Um, she's also the founder and um, art director of the new Danish screen that she will talk about after this. Please welcome Vinka Wiedemann. <laughs> now, Anna Serna is giving us a little presentation, so I'm keeping it short with a presentation about her. It's very important to mention that she is the chief executive officer of the Swedish Film Institute, SFI. And it's an, I'm quoting Maura Sullivan because she also paraphrased it so beautifully. Um, it's a national organization that finances the production, distribution, and preservation of Swedish films. Anna Serna's fresh and innovative approach is highly regarded outside of Sweden since she has taken the initiative to create a, a gender equality program. And she just added, and this has already inspired the BFI, the British Film Institute, um, Film Institutes in Canada, and the Irish Film Board. And she will go into bigger detail about what that 50-50 gender equality program actually means and implies. Please give a big welcome to Anna Serna.
Thank you. And I thought that uh, as we are all here filmmakers, let's start off uh, with a short film about this. Uh, yeah, I love this film. It's been traveling around the world now and everyone loves uh, Glenn's wife. And that is usually what, I mean, this is what it's all about, in my opinion. Who is to get picked and why, really? Uh, and if you put up the uh, presentation, uh, I, was, I have been previous uh, CEO of other organizations in Sweden. I started off being CEO when I was 34 years old, and I'm 52, so it's 18 years. And uh, I always got the questions like, how do you do it? How do you manage? How do you get your life puzzled together? And I got really tired of that. Uh, and uh, not being able to change the world in one day, I at least after quite a short while got really tired of my own voice uh, talking about this. So uh, my decision already 15, 16 years ago was to stop talk and start to act. So when I started off in the Swedish Film Institute, that's what actually what I did. I said that uh, this is not okay. We had been funding uh, films over a period. We always measure over the periods because we make too few funding decisions. And just to be clear, maybe some people here from other parts of the world, film, the Swedish Film Institute is the main funder of new film productions. So without our money, it will be very hard for anyone to make their films. And for a lot of short films, we are the only financier. Uh, but for the long feature, we are probably necessary to have as the first decision taker. So knowing that, and knowing that in the past uh, time, the past five years, we had been funding 26% female directors, which is like compared to the United States, that's three times as many as they do. They actually have declining numbers. Uh, so I'm going there quite often now and talk to the Hollywood industry. Some listen, some don't. Uh, but what we did was to say, uh, we want to make a change. This was 2011. And we said, by the end of 2015, we should fund equally. And with equally, I said very clearly, I mean 50-50 over time, not 40-60, where women is always the 40 and men are always the 60. And just saying that made a very strong signal uh, in the film industry. Uh, I put it a bit more rudely. I said, I think 4060 is rubbish. And uh, uh, I'm not afraid of quota, but I hope I don't have to do quota. And it turned out I didn't have to do quota. So what we did was that we just really made a few things. I've been working in the advertising industry. I know how media works. A few points to talk about, actions that maybe not necessarily each action makes a difference, but the buzz around the action makes a difference. So we made an action plan with five points. As you can see, we, made, uh, we decided to make a film portal to show all female key person filmmakers throughout the history since 1895. So that is called New Nordic Women in Film. It now has 700 female filmmakers name. Quite a few of them were forgotten by history, as is very often so with female, female people that they uh, sort of get erased out of history. That's, uh, we just decided to prove everyone wrong, saying there aren't any good females. Uh, we made a mentor program for women, uh, female directors that had, had made their first long feature, but wasn't allowed to make their second or to get established, uh, which is hard for any filmmaker. Everyone knows that. To make a debut is easier than to get established. But we put together five established film directors, female, and ten that only made one feature film, and gave them knowledge about the gender structure in society, and gave them tools to get their film idea from idea to the audience 
through everything that you were talking about, through the gatekeepers, film commissioners, selecting committees, distributors, producers, other financiers, and you know everyone that are supposed to uh, uh, say yes to your film. Uh, then we have made a lot of research, a lot of studies, and every study we do, we, ma we make communication about. And the fourth point here, intensifying the ongoing monitoring, that means that we don't only count how many decisions we make a year, we do it all the time. So every time we have a decision meeting, meeting which we have once a month, we count how many men and women in the positions of directing, script writing and producers. So we know all the time how we are doing, which means that if you know that, hmm, we now only have 10% women, then how about your slot? Do you have anything else coming up? What do you think about the rest of the year? And if you don't have enough, then go out, look for quality with others than the ones that actually knock on your door. As I say to a lot of producers, finding the best quality doesn't necessarily mean that you sit on your chair and let the quality come to you. Maybe you should look for quality as well. Uh, so that is what we actually do. If we find that it's too male, white dominated, we do things like open seminars or the commissioners go out and visit different parts of Sweden just to see what's bubbling out there. And by doing that, we signal that we are interested in other things than the usual suspects. So the usual suspects are not very happy all the time because they usually got the money a little bit too easy. Uh, but there are a lot of other ones that now are much more happy. Uh, and the last point is that we tried to see if the film industry is something different from the rest of society, and the short answer is no. Uh, everything is the same. So this is what happened. In, in, we released this action plan in 2012, and whoops, there we go. There's a very funny laser thing here I want to use. <laughs> this is a period 2000 to 2005. Uh, by that time, we funded 19% female directors. And if we were not there, there were 10% female directors that were actually screened. And this is only feature films. I take that as an example. And we had a female uh, CEO at the Film Institute by that time, and she said, this is no good. So she started doing actions, but she always said, we are really wanting gender equality, but we will never do it in front of quality. Which meant that to the next year, yeah, it's 7% increase, not too good in my opinion. The, uh, the rest of the world outside the film industry, film institute, 6% women. That's like the States right now. Uh, which is, oh, that one has, jumped, but doesn't matter. We, we stick to the directors. You see the screenwriters here and the producers here. So 2006, 2012, there was the next, actually, female CEO at the Swedish Film Institute, and she said exactly the same thing. This is no good. We have to work, but always quality in front of gender equality. No quota. And then I came in and I said, I'm sure there is quality that has women behind it, uh, so let's find it. And I'm not afraid of quota. And I think that working with quality means that you need to work with gender equality and diversity overall. Because if you don't let everyone get the chance, you will never reach the same quality. So that's what happened in 2012 to two to 2016, these four years, over the time we funded 49% female directors, 54% screenwrite, female screenwriters, and 44% producers. This is kind of funny because producers can be like one year 80% women. Uh, directors, <laughs> last year 2016, we funded 62% female directors, but the year before, 38. So it has to vary if it is the quality. And then do I have proof for the quality aspect? 
And of course I do, otherwise I wouldn't <laughs> say that question. Uh, but these are the results from the jury. And the jury is actually the top six uh, international film festivals that we I've been counting for 2015 and 16. And you can see Berlinale last year, we had seven films, 71% female directors, which I mean seven films in Berlinale is, we had twice as many as all the other Nordic countries together. Uh, and as you can see, quite a few female names there. In Cannes, 33, we don't have, this is no competition because we didn't have a film in competition. Well, in Toronto we did, but not in Ber Cannes and Berlin. So it's the side sections. Toronto, six films, 80% women. Berlinale, 2016, nine films. And if you imagine, we are a country of 10 million people getting nine films into the A-listed festival, and most of them are women, shows that there are some quality not discovered yet in all countries. Uh, can actually 50% women, which is hallelujah for can. Uh, Toronto last year, 20% uh, women, and Berlinale this year, 50% women. This shows, not if you, because you, if you count them all together, you would imagine that there are so many not talented men getting our funding, uh, but that's not the conclusion I would make. I would say that this shows that, first of all, women do make quality, and secondly, there are a perspective from women that is really had, have been underrepresented because they make films about exactly the same thing as men. It's life, it's death, it's friendship, it's love, whatever it is. There are no new stories to be told. Uh, a, a little bit about rape sometimes, and those ones do have another perspective when it's a female director. And all the Swedish female directors that have been funded passes the Bechtel test, their films. And I don't think that they sit at home writing their scripts and thinking, do I pass the Bechtel test? <laughs> it just comes natural, actually. And I saw two films yesterday made by women, Agnieszka Holland's film and Sally Potter's films, all with female protagonists. Everyone had a name. They talked about a lot of things, but so did the men. So with female directors, there are more interesting characters, in my opinion, actually, because they actually do get the chance to have a character. And I think that's what's shown. That means a new way of seeing things, and that feels fresh and unique and original, and that is what the film festival look for. So, uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is the proof that doing gender equality decisions uh, to make change uh, actually makes the whole industry much better. And you all will get, of course, a little bit more competition because there will be more names, talented names, to wanting the money. But on the other hand, the outcome will be better for everyone, the audience, and the ones with the really good stories, they will get to do their really good stories. So um, how do we get there all over the world? I uh, think I stop here. Thank you. Uh, I would already like to encourage you to ask immediate questions about that. Is there any intervention, comment, or question for Anna Serna? Yes. I have a loud voice, but I'll use this. Um, you said that um, once you came into the office that you um, made a, a conscious effort to go out and find talent. You didn't sit around and wait for it to come to you. I'm just wondering, can you be a bit more specific about where you were looking? I think um, I'm a male producer. I'm a white guy. So I'm sort of like the least, rep I'm also British, so I'm like the least repressed person ever. Um, but I'm very conscious of trying to like find the talent so that I can do my part to sort of walk the walk as opposed to just talk the talk and 
you, the statistics prove that you went out and you actually found the talent. I'm just curious where, where you started that process to look and um, yeah, if you just give us some advice. Yeah, I had the opportunity to sort of inherit what others have been doing. So it's not like my predecessors were doing all wrong things because they were really doing a lot of actions uh, to find the talents. So one thing they did was to start off what they called the Rookie Project, where, where uh, new people could uh, apply for the money. And it turned out it was only 20% women applying directors so they changed the last year and said this year only women and suddenly they had hundreds not only of the female directors but the production companies looking for female directors so we have the opportunity of as we are the money and money talks but I think that it's very important as you say how can everyone do and I think there are so many strong signals that you as a producer can do. You can go to the film schools and present yourself. Uh, you can actually make an event together with others that you show good examples of female directors and saying we are open for finding new female directors. And I'm sure if you put that out for the film schools, uh, not only the film schools, but the other female directors will find out as well. It's so, sometimes it's really uh, amazing how little you need to do to get the signal out. We, for instance, we don't have selecting committees in Denmark and Sweden. We have commissioners making the decisions and we have five commissioners. So there are five very important people. And we hired a black guy as a commissioner and suddenly there was a whole new community finding the way to our money but they didn't even think it was possible. And I think that goes for female directors and women overall. You just get tired of looking for money and getting a no, but if you get a signal that it's possible, they will start camp, but it will take some time. So put up a target like in five years time, I want to have found at least two women that I want to follow instead of believing that it should happen here and now, because rumor takes time sometime. Yes, there's a question over there. Uh, you were mentioning the process of how to intensify women in the business, and you talked about the mentoring program. Uh, I would be interested if you could elaborate on how the selection of this program for the, for the women who are being uh, selected would look like? Uh, <clears throat> well, it was, as I said, five established film directors having made at least five long, uh, three long features. It turns out that there aren't that many female directors that made more than three long features in Sweden. So we actually had to go to Denmark <laughs> because <laughs> the ones that, uh, there are a few, there are a lot of women female directors that don't want to be sort of a role model for gender equality. And I would really say that's very sad uh, because we all need role models. So there were some that said no and uh, some that couldn't because they were doing films and they have to do that. And then we got five, one Danish. Uh, and the 10 women actually was very hard to find as well because there is no woman who want to be stigmatized as I have a problem, I need help. <laughs> uh, so I had to call them up and asking them to apply for the program. And we gave the program, I mean it was for free. And it was a, a year, they spent a week in Berlin, everything for free and you still had to sort of push them into it. So I pushed them in with both a carrot that said that I know because I've been doing these programs before and I know it's so hard to go into it, but I know that the network they build, the, the understanding of it's not me, it's the structure, that means that you can differ between the thing and the person, uh, makes them, it's so worthwhile. So I could say that I know that you will love it. And then I had the whip, which was 
if you don't take this program, never ever come and complain to me afterwards, because uh, I can't deal with whining. Uh, if you're whining but don't take the opportunity that you are given, then uh, whine with someone else, uh, which made some people sign on. <laughs> and then they were so happy. And they're still, this was 2013, and they still have regular contact. Being director is a very lonely profession. So it wasn't a problem in selecting, it was a problem in whipping. Can I add to that? Um, thank, that your presentation was, was so great and so encouraging, and I, I completely agree with you about the structural issue. I mean, there is, in, in coming from the United States, I will say that there is a constant undercurrent of a narrative of personal failure um, among women and also among people of color and also among uh, socioeconomic classes that are less privileged. That if you come from a place of privilege, whatever the priv privilege is, you're much more likely to take risks or submit things that are not completely finished or have confidence going into financing meetings and so forth. And I think it's really important that we look at it at this at this issue of gender parity and at also at the multiplicity of genders and those who are also gender non-conforming to look at this as a structural issue, a problem of structural racism, a problem of structural discrimination, and to create a kind of pipeline to help people enter the enter enter the business wherever they are. And that pipeline is is absolutely essential. And it can not only be, I, I think the labs and mentorship are, are critical. Um, having producers and filmmakers um, in positions of power where people can proactively hire and take a chance, and I, I appreciate that you're actually seeking answers and looking for people, because that chance is, is so rarely taken. It's so much easier to go with people who are immediately and obviously financeable. And, and gendered barriers to financing are pro and, and distribution, frankly, um, because they're linked, are probably the number one obstacle to actually searching out new talent. So I think having film institutes and film schools and public financing um, is so critical to this process because if we're only relying on market forces and equity demands or in festivals sponsor demands, we're never going to be able to address this because effectively we're playing with the set of rules that those people set. And we have to set our own terms in order to actually really address this structurally. So I think this is a, this is a great initiative and it, it flows all the way through the entire structure from development all the way to launching, frankly. I think I'm um, adding to that maybe we, we, we tend to forget that the USA doesn't actually have a system like that. There is no public or national funding system. And, you know, because the US still, like, film-wise is very dominant, um, you, you, you tend to forget that many films, also at the Berlinale, I just talked to a director yesterday, like, he had to kickstart his film. That was successful, and then James Seamus and others came on board, you know, but it's, uh, yeah, if you have the privilege, as you say. Um, well, the, the one community that actually, where there is a substantial amount of, of grant funding and where there are institutions that are very proactively supporting women and more inclusive practices in terms of storytelling and whose stories get told and by whom, who are really asking those questions, is in the documentary community. The documentary community has a much better record of gender parity and um, I think that's because of the process of mentorship. It's the, it's the fact that there are women uh, very involved in financing, um, that there is an agenda that's been set by certain thought leaders like uh, Karen Mertes at the Ford Foundation and the Sundance Institute has taken a very strong stand on this Women in Film Initiative. So there are, there are players in that field. And I think also the, the people in documentary tend to be a little bit more aware of some of these disparities and actually more proactively finding solutions for them. But, but it's a great contrast because that, that market documentary is not as dominated, um, at least not yet anyway, it's not as dominated by, um, by market forces. Although in distribution it's increasingly a problem. Please. Yeah, thank you so much for reminding us that uh, strategic uh, thinking 
uh, what strategic thinking can do. And I think that uh, this is, uh, I mean, we're probably sitting here, uh, people from all over the world, and we have so different uh, uh, structures in our, uh, each our countries, so so different challenges meet us, but, uh, but the fact that we can actually also as individuals work strategic in order to achieve some goals is uh, a very important lesson if you else just, you know, have a tendency to become really frustrated or annoyed or uh, depressed. But, uh, but I would like to ask you a question. Just first of all, how many of you are outside, from outside Europe? Could you raise your hand? Okay, a few from outside Europe. So I have a question for you. What do you think from, if you could tell us where you come from and what your, uh, what you consider to be your own main challenge in uh, working, if you should work strategic on this, so in order to make your own situation better as, so this is for the females, what would be the main thing to pick on? Hello, I am uh, at the moment a professor, visiting professor of uh, Freie University in Berlin, but I uh, retired from Iwa Women's University and in Korea, and I also served as organization chair for uh, Seoul <coughs> Women's International Film Festival for about four years. <clears throat> so our initiative this festival is now 17th year, this year, and we have uh, really seen how we created uh, women producers and um, directors by being the women's festival. And I see how important it is to have that kind of uh, channel of having women uh, women's festival, although we don't close doors for male producers and directors. Um, one of the biggest challenges for us is, of course, the funding. Um, the more democratic uh, government uh, was much more generous in supporting us, but in the last how many years? <laughs> six, uh, almost 10 years, we've been very, very hard hit by the reluctance of the government in supporting us. Uh, so just the mere uh, $1,000 would go very far to support and motivate young uh, students in film schools to gather together their voluntary, you know, you know, students and staff members to, to produce one, you know, several very good films, very creative, very sort of new sites. But um, on the other hand, we had a very sad story of a, a script writer who just starved to death, which really broke so many of our hearts, you know, in, among in the affluence and abundance that happens to young artists. So this is the, the biggest challenge we have um, <laughs> suffered. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So thank everything you. From, from lack of money, yeah. lack of funding, recognizing this is important. And then if I understood you correctly, the tragedy is that some uh, students or some artists actually turn the frustration inwards. Uh, if that, if I understood you correctly, that uh, as to the point where they starve to death, starve themselves to death. And I, I just want to comment on this because uh, uh, it's so tragic to hear. And I think that uh, if we have on a statistic level one thing that differs when f men from women, and of course this can only be on a statistic level, it is a tendency to turn frustrations inwards. And, uh, and uh, uh, my mother told me a story that in the 70s, German grew uh, uh, an important uh, women's lip fighter, 
and writer. She was giving a lecture in Copenhagen for a big audience of women. And uh, there was really a nice uh, fighting a atmosphere. And then one frustrated woman, she lifted her finger and she said, but how can you believe that we can make a female revolution if 75% of us in this room are actually sexual masochists? So this was, uh, was uh, creating quite an uproar because uh, it was like touching upon a taboo. And uh, for my mother, it was, uh, it was uh, very inspiring. And she actually sit down and uh, wrote, she's a, she was a writer. She wrote a book about uh, women and masochism, exploring whether the fact that so many female, so many women have sexual masochistic fa fantasies would actually make them think that they could never be in power. And her, and her conclusion was that, of course they can, because uh, sexual instincts are one thing, and if you, uh, if you also have uh, your logics and your everyday sense of, uh, of uh, humor, you know that uh, the things you fantasize in bed may not dictate what you do during daytime. So she was very optimistic about, uh, about that, but also felt the need to say it. So I just say this because I think that we turn a lot of f females can have a tendency to turn things inward and feel ashamed about what they are and, and uh, instead of actually turning it out. So thank you for sharing your story. And I think that I've had the privilege to visit you. You invited me and it was a very amazing festival and I saw one of the most amazing films actually. Uh, but uh, it's very obvious that we have different legislations in different countries and I mean as well for the U US with a man we don't mention his name now running it downward somewhere we don't know uh, but how do we work to a, a higher level and uh, it's of course uh, like any lobbying but uh, for instance, Sweden, we claim to have a feministic government and we actually do a lot of things. So reach out and uh, invite uh, and take the Swedish embassy uh, to do things together. But as well within different countries, when I've been traveling now around the world talking about this, I really see that there are so many female networks that uh, can give energy, because I think that's really important when you're sort of fighting for long term, how do you get the energy to do that? Uh, because what all we want is to get the money to m be able to make the films. So uh, how do we get the energy of uh, getting there? And having networks where you actually can share, but not, uh, that's my advice, don't sit there and whine again, because whining is really energy taking. Uh, and everyone said, no, I didn't either, and they were stupid, and they were stupid. Make an action plan, make a goal, like in five years time, what should we achieve? And what should we do? Who should we meet? Who should we ask questions? Because look at Thierry Fremont in, in Cannes. Uh, who actually believes that quality is equal men. Uh, but he hates the question. And now he's getting questioned all the time and he gets really frustrated. But do that and uh, question the, the ones in power in, did you count? A lot of people say they count. And then I ask, are you sure that you're counting? Oh yes, we are counting. I was in, in Georgia, in Tbilisi, and uh, they were introducing me and saying, yeah, hello and welcome. Uh, and uh, then say, well, you know, we have an opposite problem. We found almost only women. And I was like, okay, you found, then why am I here? Uh, yeah, we find, found like 70% are women. Uh, okay, that was the Film Institute. And then I met with the ones that I were giving the lecture and there was only women. And uh, not even the guy who invited me was there because he had so many important things to do. So he left the room. And there I was standing in front of a lot of women and I was like, are you directors? Yeah, but they were all directors, female directors. Uh, yeah, I may have misunderstood this, but is it true that you're fund in, in Georgia you're funding mostly women? Oh, yeah. We, yeah, yeah, that's a problem here. 
I was okay. Uh, well, then I make my presentations anyway, and uh, I'm sorry that we are lacking behind here. And I started to uh, give this presentation, and then I had a colleague of mine sitting in the same room, and she found a yearly report with all the people getting funding. So she started counting. And then, I didn't know that, because suddenly she just raised her hand and said, yeah, what do you want to say? I said, yeah, uh, you know, I've been counting. You don't fund more women. You fund more men. It's 30% women, which is kind of good in Georgia, but it's 70% men. And you could see the women were like, uh, yeah, no. And then they started to explain why. Uh, that must be because uh, we, the women do much better in festivals. So it's much more talk about women. So they get more attention. So it feels like the women get all the money. Uh, I said, yeah, okay, uh, that's a possible explanation. But we were in a room and there were a lot of posters of all these Georgian films with the names that I couldn't understand if they were a man or a woman. So I said, okay, if you're true, all these posters should be mostly women as they are the most successful one. And they said, yeah. So, okay, let's start. Man or woman? It was like man, 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 woman, man, man, man. I said, so what are you doing? And you know, when you start count and see the result, then the, it kicks in and you realize. And that's what you need the decision makers to do as well. So if they don't count, start counting and show the numbers and make an you know, article in the newspapers comparing, you can use my numbers, if Sweden can, why can't we, you know, whatever. Uh, because they need to wake up, but you need to remind them. So that could be one action. <laughs> We're 15 minutes in the event and Isabel Schuba hasn't said a word yet, and I think uh, we should change that. And I want to take your question about the mentoring program because like, we could actually spread that to the entire panel because you all are the Danish screen. Um, you could talk about that and you can also talk about uh, Into the Wild and I would like you to talk about because uh, taking your advice of stop stopping whining, um, she did that and she's not whining and she started a program and we want to know more about it. Um, yeah, hello. Yeah, it was just listening because it's, uh, it's very interesting and... Um, I was just thinking about why this is all, all is still happening, like what you say, um, because I think I am one of the only female directors or make filmmakers. Sorry, I have to get used to English again. You are all so fluent. Um, that really do something about it. Like this discussion is not very new now. When I did the film in 2012 and 13, it was screened and then screened and then. We have the um, Pro Quote in Germany, I don't know if you know it, it's like uh, some woman, uh, or um, is now a lot of women who founded this um, Quote uh, Foundation and they want, um, of course, they want 50% in 10 years um, or 12 years of filmmaking in Germany. So this discussion is like um, now uh, five years old and I'm still the only one uh, who does, who does, uh, who goes to action in this whole sector and I ask myself how could this be I mean the new generation should be the first who says okay we are not okay with this anymore um, ba basically you would all say I guess um, and because we are open you can uh, say something to it you have uh, equality relationships um, you don't have men anymore like with the short film I hope so and um, why does this not what what is wrong with our generation or the time now that this is so uh, bequem, Easy, yeah, too, too comfortable to go out because it's not funny. It's like I'm I'm listening to this, and since five years, and I'm so basically, of course, I'm angry, but basically, I'm just sad that it's still going on. And if only more people would do something about it, and I mean, all you guys, um, young people, who start really counting because you say this. And I listen to all this woman going to the panel saying, you can do this, you can do that, but they don't do it. And I'm in a lot of um, contact with young filmmakers now because I have founded this um, program. And they're all like, oh, Isabel, you are so great and that you do it and blah, blah, blah. And I just think, yeah, but uh, I'm on my own, so just start the thing. I think this is very important to say 
um, I'm also very uh, sad, or no, not sad, it's the wrong word, uh, tired of this discussion. I mean, it's important, and it's important to count the numbers, but you have to sit down, you have to um, make uh, networks, and I mean, get your, like, immediately, like tomorrow, you know, um, go and call people and make a circle together and, and go, there are so many groups and you should really do something about it because I think, yeah, I mean, I can't, it's always the same. I just was yesterday at the FFH, it's a very big founding system in Germany, basically the biggest one, they get all the numbers, like two years they're counting from everything and it's again, like, we directors have mostly the best um, numbers. It's, uh, it's only 23% of uh, female directors who um, make film in TV and, 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 and cinema. So you can think of that the most people uh, can't live out of this job. And it's only 14% of producers. I was shocked by this number. I mean, 14%, I was, when I studied, like the women were really had the big projects, they make the best movies, um, they were always constantly in, um, so I, I don't know. And um, yeah, I think we should really change something about it. So I founded this uh, program, but now I will just, I think this was enough information. No? <laughs> Maybe you want to say something about Without it. Without saying well, how you work uh, the program actually, right? Yeah, I mean, I did this, I, I thought maybe people want to say something about okay. this, like getting in, getting in the movement. Do you really do something or you just think, oh, uh, it's so sad, I'm whining, and there are some people who just do something about it. I mean, stop asking questions, do something. <laughs> well, doesn't sound, yeah. Uh, well, I'm from Chile. I'm Chilean Swedish, actually. I grew up in Sweden until I was 21. I've been living for 11 years in Santiago. And I'm a filmmaker and producer. And um, I just wanted to ask you, with your experience, a little bit what you're talking about, if we could do something about it. <laughs> in Chile, we have a um, very misogynist tradition. <laughs> like, in power situations, there are like, hardly women like anywhere. And what have happened is that um, like lately, since we have had our first female president, uh, like a lot of people have said like, okay, so now you have a female president, so of course you are like so developed, but still we are like one of three countries in the entire world who doesn't allow abortion in any kind of ways. I mean, even if your child is going to be, you know, dead when birth, giving labor, uh, they force you to, to give labor. So we have a very misogynist uh, structure and so what I've been doing lately, like last year I got involved in the Producers Association, which is mainly men of course, and to the big meetings, sometimes the big important people come and sometimes they just send their female assistant. Um, so I'm one of the few producers who is actually like owner of her company and you know, uh, talking from myself, so to say. Um, and what I found the most difficult is that since we have this tradition, um, Fem feminism and all this gender issue um, right now in Chile seem to be like uh, interpreted as a luxury problem. Like we have so many other problems like with poverty and uh, like class problems. We have very segregated society and racism and so on. So they kind of like, when you try to talk about these things, it's like, you know, we have so many other things that we need to think, think about, but then you try to propose things like 4060, for example, we had a big discussion like not long time ago, uh, and people are like, no, no, of course you can't do that, that's quoting, like that's really unfair for the projects and it has to be the quality and so on. And so I try to like take out statistics and I, for example, for the cinema catalog, catalog that is like, um, uh, what we promote in our markets, like from the Film Commission. Uh, I like counted, so there was like 22 films last year, future films, and only two women, uh, and one co-directed, one woman and one man. Um, so I made them see this, and also, I don't know if it's a casualty, but the two women that were uh, in the catalog were also um, homosexual, which is also like a big debate, because it happens to us a lot in Chile that they kind of try to put one woman that is not threatening to them really because she's like different from them. So they put her and they're like, look, look, we have this woman here. And that's like, okay, that's really cool. But what about your pairs, you know, what you really are looking at as your pairs? Not because I believe that 
this is not, not we should all be pairs. I'm just saying that how they are looking at this. Like, uh, um, so, so all this discussion becomes like a luxury thing and it's also very violent. Like um, last month we had, um, like the, there's an annual meeting for all the entrepreneurs, like the big owners of, of the companies. And they made um, a speech where they uh, showed an inflatable woman like, uh, you know, this one that you can buy for having sex, like plastic woman. Um, they put her, there were eight, uh, eight like really important people from Chile, including the economy minister. Um, and they took this woman, plastic woman, and they said, the economy is like the women, you have to stimulate her. Okay, so this is really gross. And this happened, you know, officially. This is like the most important people and what, we got was basically our president, who is a female, saying, oh, you should apologize for that. They didn't fire him, they didn't, you know, so uh, yeah, that was maybe like not really good to say. And people were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all this discussion is like, you talk to people and you get a lot of violence back. Like, so what I wanted to ask you is how can you try to talk about these things without receiving the violence and the exclusion because I've started to feel a lot that many of my colleagues, like all the colleagues that are male producers, are starting to avoid me, you know? They're starting to, because they notice that I'm like, you know, putting the finger up. And I'm getting more and more scared in that sense that this also have like a very negative co consequence in my career. So how do you deal with this, like with your experience? How can you? treat this. Yeah. I, I, thank you for, for explaining the situation that you've experienced in Chile. As we know with Bachelet and Chile uh, has solved misogyny like Obama has solved racism in America. <laughs> it's the same, <laughs> same issue, right? It's, um, you know, it's experiencing now in the U.S. this regression and what I would call an aesthetics of menace where we now had to have a head of state who is surrounded by people in positions of power who have committed sexual assault. It's a, it's a, it's a very, I, in my view, a very deliberate um, war being launched on women in many places in the world. And I think misogyny exists everywhere. Sometimes it's really hidden. In some places it's more obvious. And the kind of violence that you're describing, the structural violence as well as the more intimate violence, the more experience of this kind of intimate violence you're supposed to experience that. That's the idea behind stop and frisk and checkpoints and uh, you know all these kind of things is that you should experience it physically in your day-to-day -day life so that you are intimidated to ask for more. I think you know, coming from the U.S., we have a kind of uh, there's a perception, uh, I think, of of privilege, of course, in in the U.S. because it's such a wealthy country. But there are so many of these problems in the states as well. And I think the way that we've tried to respond to it um, is through various institutions that exist in the US, but also by banding together. I and mean, we've created a, a, a creative producers group to try to address women in producing and how women in producing can advance women in other parts of the film industry, whether it's cinematographer, I mean, everything from you know, production assistants to, to financiers. We've gone to people uh, in the financing and distribution sectors to talk about the, the various barriers to the advancement of women um, and try to really, I think the only thing that has really moved the needle has been actually banding together and helping each other get from start to finish and get the films out. I mean, the fact that there's an assault on culture, I think, is also very deliberate because it's, culture is so important in moving public perception and in changing how people see. And so if we're all agreeing on a, on a if we can imagine that the, that the reality that we are all agreeing is a reality, is something that's agreed, um, film helps us see that it's not static, that it's something that can actually change. And that is such a that is such a, a powerful thing. So I would just urge you to find other like like-minded women and men, um, if you can, in Santiago and elsewhere in Latin America, and also form as many international co-production alliances as you can. Um, I don't know what your resources are like, or whether you can travel to festivals, or whether you can reach out through the various networks that exist, but. It is really important, in my experience, to reach out to people across countries 
as well as within your own within your own base community to try to find that kind of support, and also maybe sometimes work with budgets that are um, perhaps a little reduced in order to build your build your capacity. Uh, I think sometimes people try to start at a, at a much larger number, uh, and and that creates other kinds of obstacles. But I have found that working in a lower budget range gives me more freedom and more autonomy and, and allows me to have more choices and to also work with more public funding institutions in other parts of the world. Co-productions are absolutely essential for all of us if we are going to make content that is not regressive, content that is sincerely progressive or, or even radical. It's, it's the only way. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. You want to say something yeah, too? Yeah, I just want to say that, uh, again, I think you point uh, through sharing the story to the fact that, uh, that we as women, uh, you know, it's really, really difficult not to define yourself as a woman first. Uh, and and uh, your story shows that because it becomes physical, it becomes about my body. And then, of course, also about my mind, my sense of my identity. So uh, a big, big danger in our everyday life is that we tend to see ourselves as women before human beings. And, uh, and as such, I think we are already reducing uh, the, the perspective on our lives and on, on our minds. So we, still we have to forget, to, still we have to remember that... Uh, Everybody in this world, apart from a few very, very privileged persons, and I guess we are some of them, if we look throughout world history, despite the fact that they grew up on a, under terrible circumstances and reducing circumstances, they actually had a free will and a free thought and a free spirit. So, uh, so I just think that if we want to deal with this, I said, as I said before, we must work strategically. We must realize that, uh, that we have challenges that range all the way from uh, big society structures all the way down to how much time did we spend this morning on our makeup or how many of us spend time uh, thinking about what clothes to wear today and whether the right or wrong choice of clothes would make it a good day or a bad day. You know, and was this time well spent uh, or not? So we have to to realize that that we have to work strategically on all these levels. So we also have to work on how to make um, how to make an influence on society structures, but also how do we look at each other? And and for me personally, I think that this aesthetic problem of uh, the way, the looks, the big, big impact, the, what we look like uh, has on ourselves uh, is uh, something that I have to deal with every day, but I also have to deal with it. Then I just want to say one thing, because I have been in talent development schemes, and I'm also a woman myself <laughs> who had a, a, a funny way through uh, my career. And I think that uh, actually, uh, what meant very much to me was um, the fact that someone gave me the chance uh, and uh, that I got in positions where I was able to give someone else a chance. Um, I think a lot of our structure in society is such that we have to work in an environments of resistance. That's also what you're talking about. They're getting hostile. So what you, should you do? You should get used to being in a, an environment that is hostile because it's the easiest card to play, you know. So just be a bit aggressive or just, you know, ignore you or something and then most people will back out. So, so be used to be in a, in a... You can train that, you know. You can train that. There are actually courses for that. But also, I just want to, it's really stupid, as I'm going to say, but I want to thank the Berlinale, because uh, when we did New Danish Screen, this uh, project, uh, a young, talented girl, uh, I gave her the chance because I thought she was extremely talented, 
and she had this really crazy uh, story about uh, a guy who was a transsexual and he wanted to have a sex uh, agenda operation. And, um, and he and a, a, a lesbian, a, th a girl who believed she was maybe lesbian, they fell in love. And, and, uh, and we worked on this story very hard and uh, they wanted to shut the, the support scheme down in Denmark and the male CEO was fighting in the parliament to let us keep this system. And while he was doing that, I was working with, a, with this uh, tiny, tiny, small movie of two characters in two small flats. And eventually, when it finished, uh, we showed it to Dieter Koslik. And Dieter Koslik took it to the selection committee. And the selection committee actually chose to uh, select it for the competition. And the jury actually loved it and gave it both the first feature award and the silver bear for best film. And in Denmark, this giving chances gave this film a recognition that actually pulled back. So after the politicians and the producers association had been fighting this scheme, then next time they actually gave it 50% more money. So, you know, but giving chances, giving me the chance of being heading the scheme and so on, of going to film school, was giving the chance to, you know, believing in that something might happen, even though I was not a safeguard, you know. I did a terrible uh, test when I was in uh, applying for film school myself. Terrible, terrible test. But they gave me the chance. So remember to give someone else the chance and train to be in hostile environments. <laughs> I hate microphones. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. It's like you get used to them. Train the microphone. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. <laughs> All right. Should I start singing, maybe? <laughs> so, um, I'm Brazilian, and I, I, I graduated in the film school in Cuba, and when we left the school, some of the female filmmakers just got connected, actually, just to study feminism and to, like, we read The Second Sex, and we were discussing it among ourselves. It was not meant to be a public thing, but we just entered such an amazing world that at some point we were like, hey, why, why aren't we sharing this with other people? And then we just made an open thing, and this grew and became bigger and bigger, and suddenly our collective became like a kind of a reference in, in, in Sao Paulo for for gender representation and discussion. And, and I, I just wanted to say that from, it's been two years, we're like, we're, we're actually trying to take a Nasserna to Brazil since last year. We're gonna make it at some point. <laughs> and uh, we've been showing, until we can't take her, we've been showing her videos and, and translating them into Portuguese. We've been discussing, we've been, Uniting, and the only thing I wanted to say, I also come from a very misogynous country. We've just had this um, putsch, this coup d'etat that was totally based on misogynous reasons as well. So I just wanted quickly, because I actually jumped to the line, I just wanted to say that doors close, but others open when you say what you think. So um, I totally encourage you not to be afraid of that, because since we've begun it, it's been amazing all the women and men that came to us and, we've, and, and how this network is starting to grow and how important <laughs> it felt to actually talk about it and the difference that it's actually making in, 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 yeah. in our community. So now, uh, and I'll, 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 I'll go back I'll give back the microphone, but one of the things I would like to put as a question, because representation is important and is one of our um, main goals, and we're, we're trying to seduce uh, the, the people in, in <coughs> representing our national film agency to actually like have this meeting with Anna Serna and talk and, 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 and but for me, 
One of the most important questions right now as a second step is also to debate the content and, and the, actual, um, the actual patriarchal structures inside the script itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of, I mean, if you, if you even go back to the journey of the hero and, and, and the sentences of Campbell on, on what a female represents, um, how do you say, um, dramaturgically, this is also like another panel and another huge. Um, so this this is for me also one of the most important things, like that we're uniting to discuss representation, but that we're also uniting to discuss dramaturgy and 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 what is enrooted inside the dramaturgical. But but like hey, doors close, but others open, and that's really cool, you know. So <laughs> sorry. For uh, thank you very much for your contributions. I just want to say, uh, as the Debbie Downer of this, we have officially we have 15 minutes left, but we can make 10 minutes more. I love I love the fact that everyone is opening up so much. Maybe um, there is a contribution over there. Then there's one here. Isabella wanted to say something. Maybe for the sake of diversity and more voices, we can keep it a little shorter, so we can, uh, if that's possible. I don't want to cut anyone short. I will be really short. Uh, I'm uh, coming uh, from Montenegro and uh, it's a really traditional context of living there. And uh, before a couple of months actually, uh, European Union um, uh, discussed about the problems what we have there and that's the all uh, uh, um, kids who are, um, who are female, they are aborted. And uh, and like a woman check like until three months or something like uh, if they are uh, female they are aborted, and it's uh, awful stuff. And also uh, I'm 33 years old, but for my mom and dad I'm still son. Uh, they call me son. Generally on the Balkan the situation is like that that they call you son. It's so funny for me, but it's tragic comedy somehow. And also there is no female director in Montenegro. Was one who actually made the film before maybe 10 years and uh, always uh, we heard some negative connotation about her. To not mention like a whore or something, bitch or something, that kind of words, why not actually. Yeah, and generally today situation is uh, whoever doing something in filmmaking in uh, Montenegro is like uh, how she get the money, with who she sleep, uh, what she's doing and blah, blah, blah. So it's so, so annoying and hard their situation. And plus Montenegro is part of Southeast Europe, so we are on European continent actually. And... Uh, somehow is really annoying and uh, I don't know what to do about uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, I think uh, one suggestion is because of course you can't change the uh, misogynist structure in a country like that. Uh, but first of all, I just want to say that being a role model, which you are uh, very much, uh, I really just want to encourage you that is so, so important. So keep up it. Don't give up. And all the guys like uh, you who said that you really want to make a change, it's so important that men start to talk about it and being role models. Uh, so. Can I just say, I don't need a microphone. I think that's arguably the most important yeah. thing. Yeah. It's not a woman's problem, it's the humanity problem. No. Yeah. The reality is, sadly, that men do control this industry. Yeah. And it's going to take men with a feminist perspective to support the people at the bottom to help that kind of rise. Um, I, I would empower, like, I consider myself one of those men. I hedge my bets that there's more in this room, more for the Malay. to seek out the men yeah. who can help your cause. Because can, I'm gonna just interrupt you and say, I, I really appreciate that, but I think that women's agency is actually the number one issue. And I think women, I, I mean, we do need 
men like yourself who, who care and are engaged. And I think we have to form alliances everywhere that we can. And I appreciate what you're saying, but I really do think that um, it is a societal issue, it's a structural issue, and men and women have to deal with it. And, and, but women also have to find within, especially in contexts like this where we're not talking about whining, but we're dealing with a huge obstacles in, in Chile, Montenegro, elsewhere, US, UK, statistics are terrible in the UK as well. Uh, you know, the, the, this is something where women have to also find each other, help each other, and form these alliances that you're describing. Um, but the agency has to come also from women. And it's not enough that men just, that, 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 to, you know, to, to point to men as the number one issue, I think it's certainly the number one obstacle, but that's, a, that's connected also to, to economic structures and to perceptions, right? It's, it's not that individual men are the problem, I mean, sometimes individuals are the problem, but structurally, that's not the problem. The problem is actually the macroeconomic structure that we're all living under, the way that, that, that those power dynamics are shaped by that. We examine power dynamics in our narratives. I'm glad you raised the issue of narrative because 99% of Western narratives are based entirely on ideas of conflict. That, like, no one talks about that. Every three-act structure, every dramatic you know, obstacle, Everything is about conflict, and we wonder why there's so much conflict in our society. The three major religious stories, J Judaism, Christianity, and Islam right now, they all end in apocalypse. And we're wondering, oh, why is everything so apocalyptic? Well, you know, there are three huge stories here that are actually determining narratives in novels, in films, in series, and in young adult literature, which is very dystopian. And these are things that have to be unpacked, and they're all, they, ha they intersect. Class, race, sex, gender, they all intersect. And I appreciate all the different perspectives that are being brought to this, but I think we have to connect the dots. That's also really, really key. And find our own agency, and find our own collectives where they exist, and build those bridges. Because otherwise, again, we're meeting people on the terms that are set by the market, and we are never, ever, going to be able to fight that battle on its own terms. We have to change the terms. But this is very interesting because this is actually the big thing about this. It's so much an individual problem uh, connected with the microeconomic structure globally. And I think everyone needs to find their own way. So, I mean, more men and reaching out and making men talk about it to other men and uh, you know do whatever you can as being a woman. I find it very uh, useful to connect with other women. And we actually made a list of answers to stupid questions, uh, which is very good. So when you hear that kind of question, you know, why is there so few women? You can just, you know, snap it off and say, yeah, you think about list? that for a while. And, you know, so you make them shut up because sometimes you just can't go into arguing. You just want quick answers to make them shut up. And then on the other hand, you really need to have big knowledge sometimes to start the conversation. Uh, so you can, you know, deepen the conversation. So sometimes quick away and sometimes deepen the conversation. There are so many research that has been made. Uh, for instance, there is this research about quality, if I can just, because I think it's so good to have in your back pocket. Uh, the Boston Symphony Orchestra wanted to uh, uh, employ more female musicians in the orchestra. And they wanted to do it gender equal to, to get a parity in the orchestra. So they made the uh, audition anonymously. So the musicians came in behind a closed curtain and the jury was sitting like you and they didn't see who was the mu musician. And they came in and they played their little song and they went out again. And after being doing that, the jury was supposed to pick them and they picked more men, which was very disappointing for everyone. <laughs> Uh, and you could start, you know, doing the investigation of why is it because men are better in their DNA to be a musician, or is it because women have to take care of their, but the children, so they don't get to rehearse, and that's why they don't get good enough. And these are very good questions sometimes, but this time they decided to do it again, 
but doing it even more anonymously. So they put a thick carpet on the floor. So the, mus the same musicians went in doing the same songs, but you couldn't hear who was walking on the floor. <laughs> Suddenly, the jury picked 50-50. And I think that is so good to keep in mind, that we, be, we believe that we do rational decisions, but we really, we really perceive that geniuses are men, quality is male. But suddenly it turned out that the quality was individual, the individual musician. And if you know this, throw it in someone's face when they say there aren't any good women, because yes, there are. There has been an audience voice that has been cut, I think, eight times by now. Is it, was there not a woman over there? Yeah. yeah, but weren't you not waiting like a million years? Okay, I'm so sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. Sorry, right. there's one here. Um, hi, my name is Zamo. I'm from South Africa. Um, you, some of you will know something about the history of South Africa, um, and some of you won't. Um, but basically... Um, South Africa is a 90% black country, um, and uh, the economy is essentially um, completely white controlled. Um, so we have government programs, uh, we've got the National Firm and Fairly Foundation and all kinds of other things going on um, that obviously care about these questions about um, gender equality and, and, and racial parity and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the narrative uh, in my world is very much, uh, very similar to this um, example from Sibilisi, uh, which is that, uh, oh, you're a black and you're a woman and you're a director, you have all the opportunities and it's completely untrue. Yeah. Um, and um, what this, this question comes uh, to really the nitty gritties, which is making money. Um, so uh, in terms of, of, of the government funding and, and um, getting into programs like talents and all that sort of stuff, I'm starting to see results. Um, I, I make the applications, uh, most of them say no, but there are enough that say yes for me to feel like I'm getting some traction. But the truth is that as I'm sitting here, I'm losing money. I'm not making money, I'm, uh, I'm, it's to, to be in Europe, as an African, is a shockingly expensive, uh, expensive thing. Um, and, uh, but of course, I'm going to be here because I care about what I do, and this is incredibly important to me. Um, and the strategy that I have figured out and what I've seen from people who are going in the direction where, that I want to go is that, um, you know, what you do is that you then go into directing commercials. Um, you do a, a, a TV commercial for uh, British Petroleum or Total or whatever, uh, you make some money and then you are actually able to take two weeks out to come to Berlinale and actually push your career. Now, um, a thing uh, that is a black female commercials director in South Africa is just non-existent. It doesn't exist. It's not there. Um, and you knock on the door and you knock on the door and I've been knocking on the doors and it's never opened even a crack. And I studied <laughs> advertising, so it's really ironic for me. It's like, wow, I really know what I'm doing, but I'm never going to be hired. Um, so my question really is around how do we harness um, the, the, the goodwill, the, 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 the good intentions uh, of people that sit on, on government funding bodies and then take that uh, and, and, and try to put pressure on, the, on, on business, on, on the more commercial, because commercials are, are funded fundamentally by, by, by businesses and those businesses are completely white controlled and they don't, they really, really don't like black people. I mean, if you know the history of South Africa, that hasn't changed, despite Mandela. He's like Obama. <laughs> um, so, so this is, um, a, a, but, but it's not just because I'm black, it's also because I'm black and female, and I'm black and female all the time. Uh, that, that I don't ever get to leave one of them at home and like, you know, sort of uh, try and, and get through the crack. Um, so how, how do we harness, the, the question is, how do we harness the goodwill of, the people in government bodies and, and, and sort of translate that into um, 
business, where the money is. If you should answer the question yourself, just what is your first thought? What could we do? Because I think you, you may have the answer rather than we might have. I've been trying for about 20 years. I really don't have it. I, I, if, I, if I had it, I promise you I would have. I want that money. <laughs> I don't know how. I really um, don't. I can maybe, from my perspective, because maybe we are in the same age, I just had this problem with this program. Um, basically, to all questions you, uh, or the discussion, I would I still have to say it's very important, firstly, that you find um, friends, to, you have to build a group. This is my answer. You can't do it alone. And um, I mean, in Europe, we don't have this aggressive, they can't go on the street and uh, hit us, but it's still aggressive. And you have to do all those, to, like find, woman has to be, you have to be get professional, get a lot of information. You need to be better than everybody else. You need to have all the information. You need to t make time in the week in your schedule to say, okay, today I read only two hours, you know, about the situation so I can be um, in discussion. And then you really have to just very basically, as uh, TKKD does it, I don't know if you know it, you just take the phone, you all be on your phone all the time right now, uh, which I really don't like because uh, if you come here, do the choice, be here, like almost everybody of you has a phone all the time looking on it. I mean, if you want to change something, start co um, be connected to reality and you have to find... Um, you have to find a group. You have to call your friends. You have to be. You have to be get big. Uh, even in your country, in Chile, I mean, this is the only thing you can do. If you have a lot of people, every revolution mm. in history against our male-dominated uh, presidents um, is when people come together. I think this is really the only thing. Then you have to. I would do it with a program. I went to all every uh, every single um, foundation in Germany. I called them. I was really scared, like because basically I'm a filmmaker, I want money from them. So this were like the biggest uh, woman in film business. And I was like, sometimes it took me two weeks to do only get them on the phone. I get crazy because I made a film last year and this program, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like shaking on the telephone and saying, but we need this program. I need money from you because, uh, you know, the film, young filmmakers. And they, the first thing was always, no, we don't need that. Um, why should we need this? We have... Um, it's the other way around. It's the same thing. We are talking about women five years now. Uh, so we just basically we have a problem with the men because they, they don't have role models anymore. And I was like, what? No, no, no. Uh, you misunderstood something. Like, um, so I just continued doing it. And now it's like, I mean, I don't know how many hours of work I did in the last two years. And I don't want to say this because I think I'm so great. Uh, it is frustrating. It's going to be frustrating. It's going to be hard work. But you have to get together. And then also one thing is very good uh, in my experience, you need money. Um, even if you uh, have not so much, but if you have a lot of people, you can say you spend every month like 10 euro or I don't know what, how much is much for you, but you can go until 100 if you have people who earn more. And then you, you, you raise money and you set goals, like what do you want to do with it, you know? And then you do something with the money um, for everybody. So it's like making a plan. It's like really just very easily business plan. Bring people together from all kinds of uh, BVL and from people who, who can go with money. Go to the stocks, you know, like just we are so uh, modern today and raise money, raise groups and ha use the hashtag thing in Chile. I mean, it can't be, if they are really aggressive, you have to take the, make a video and uh, share it on the internet, the, use the social media, don't be always a slave with a fucking telephone all the time. Um, <laughs> so angry with us, like, I, this is my answer, should be. So this, in the South African context, um, I, um, I know that I've, I've heard from other South African colleagues about being trapped in this sort of mentorship, endless cycle of mentorship and training, that as valuable as it is up to a certain point, it's like you're preparing to work and preparing to work and never working and never making a living. So I, I really appreciate the question because it, it's, a, it's a problem of mentorship in general that, the, that those opportunities need to be created. I think in the South African context, especially around commercials, I know that it was so dominated by, it's, it's always been dominated by the white industry there. I'm aware of that. I think, do you know Tebaho Mahalatsi? 
the filmmaker? Too? Yes, I do. Yeah. So when, when he was starting, um, and you know, he formed his own company um, with other partners who are white, but they, they started their own company. They had come out of the anti-apartheid struggle and founded their own company. And he went on to be very, do very, have a lot of success doing commercials. And I think some of the earliest commercials that they did came from black businesses. And that, that was how they actually broke into the market. And, and also it helps that that group of people has absolutely staggering and undeniable talent. And so they were able to marshal that as well as allies in the business community to, to, to start their business. And that might be a model to explore or go and speak with him about. He's one of the most successful commercials directors, I think. Yeah. Hello. We have Binka first. Did you directly want to answer that question? Because we have an audience question there as well. OK, go. There is a tribe in Madagascar that have five genders. You would have the female female, very feminine, you would have the male, male, aggressive, you would have the female, male, also a bit more aggressive, and the male, female, more effeminate. And the fifth gender would be the shaman that would have both uh, sexual energy balanced. So do you think it is possible if we go out from this uh, binary paradigm, man and woman, and play a bit in a more the, the, the gray area between these, uh, maybe we wouldn't be faced with such problems. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a direct answer to that from the audience? Or is, is it or not so-so? Um, sort of, because good idea. And I, I'm, a part of me is 100% behind that and also, um, but I, when I heard the thing, we need to forget, or we need to think about less that we're women, difficult. Because I'm a, I'm a woman 100% of the time. And then it comes, sometimes it comes down to such a mundane problem as when I set up our, uh, the initiative in, in Scotland where I live now um, to um, build a network among female filmmakers and have our monthly meetings. The first seven who came, two of them said to me, I won't be able to come very much because I have children. I've got to look after them. One of them is a single mum. Uh, this is a very old story, <laughs> that is, but this is still, for some, uh, for some people, this is still an actual problem. And um, just in um, a positive note, actually, where I want to get to is um, when you say form, form groups and help yourself. What I, um, I don't have that yet in Scotland, it's probably then my, my task to do this. In England, then, I found... Hmm? Include the children. I, I'm actually looking for a venue or a possibility to maybe for them to bring them along, do this on the weekend will take time, but there, there is there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, the other thing is, um, just an example, in England there's a great sort of small agency and they're called Raising Films. And they've made it their agenda to work with women who raise films and their children at the same time. And I just found that, that really great, just in terms of don't forget that we're women. I think it's, it's, that's our body, that's how we are, we cannot forget about it. We get in situations where we um, have responsibility for someone else and where we normally just step back because this should be more important and I can't do my job so then, then we lose the opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, yeah. We're very far away also from her question about the five genders and maybe we can, you have a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can answer I just, both. <laughs> I yeah, I just want to say that uh, um, when my brother, a very masculine man, when he had a hormone disease, he lost all all his hair, and it was crazy to see how uh, the way you perceived him changed so dramatically that uh, at least he changed within these categories that we just heard about before, just because. He didn't have a beard, and he didn't have any hair, and he didn't have any eyebrows. So, and he didn't have any hair on his body. So, so uh, of course, uh, I don't think we can ever forget our 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 sex or our gender. But uh, but maybe we should not just identify with that because I think that's a tr that's a trap. So I just want to say that one of the greatest filmmakers I worked with uh, on developing female characters. Uh, that are really interesting and surprising and provoking is Lars von Trier. And uh, the, way he, the way he actually works with his characters is that he doesn't care about... Uh, of course, it's very much about gender and sex, his, uh, his, uh, his stories, 
but, uh, but what he draws on all kinds of experiences when he uh, builds his characters. And, uh, and a lot of the time when he draws on his own experience and puts specific experiences of his own into his female characters, that is when, uh, when women feel most recognized. So uh, there are very many ways we can deal with gender and deal with it also in our content. Uh, and I agree, I, I, if we had another hour, we should just talk about the content. That's what I had set out to do. But now instead, because the discussion moved in another direction, I will end up just by saying that we're talking about really, really big and serious and difficult issues. And some of you are dealing with such immense challenges. I just want to send you all my good energy and say that if you have to deal with that big challenges, you have to remember that the first step is the step right here. And the first step will always be sharing. And, and sharing with a network is not trying to, in the first move will never be to go with something that is outside of you. It will always be to go to the one you know the best. So if you define your own network as you're in the center and then people, the person next to, to you is the one you should share with, then you're already going and it's much, much more easy than if you consider that network to be something outside and you are, and you are, you know, out here. So you are not in the periphery, you are in the center and you have to look for the one next to you. That's where it I begins. I think that's a beautiful closing statement, but Anna also wants to... Yeah, no, I just wanted to give out some uh, practical advice <laughs> to survive because we are talking, as you say, we talk about very, very big things and there are so many of these issues that we as individuals can't do anything about. But what you can do is ask questions to people in charge, uh, ask people in charge out for lunch, buy them a lunch, ask them what they think could be made uh, and make a conversation that makes that you get a relationship with the funders. And uh, always remember that people like to be flattered. So uh, when they do good things, tell them that they are doing good things uh, because that makes them more, because I can tell you being in, in charge of doing things, it's not only love that I receive. I receive a lot of other things. So I really need the support from people that see what I'm doing. So it's, I mean, you can work on very small basis, uh, but you can just make a lunch appointment when you go out today. Well, I just have this perfect uh, opposition to that because it's a little uh, love quote on Valentine's Day we have today. And it's not going out to my wonderful girlfriend where, where it should go to, but it, I wanted to say um, it goes out to you because I founded this program or had the idea because I saw you uh, four, five years or four years ago at Pro Quote Regie there. You had a very a longer um, spot than 10 minutes and you had all these good practical advices and uh, like maybe two months after it just really hits me. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm also stop uh, talking about it. I'm doing something about it. And you were so enc encouraged myself so much. So I was very happy to be on the uh, thing with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much for this beautiful discussion. I had the feeling that that was a big um, a need to talk and that there is a, some, sort of an idea of a safe space created. And I like that we had so many diverse conversations, but I also think um, that with all these panels, I want to uh, quote Christine Vachon, who was here last year, who's this very prolific queer independent producer, who says, like, you know, um, quoting what you said, all we do is like be on panels and to discuss the fact that, you know, um, how bad it is for women, and this is sort of it, and we discussed this beforehand, and I wasn't happy with it. I said to Florian, oh yeah, another panel about gender equality, great. But you were also practical with your ideas, and I want to suggest, and this is being recorded, and please don't cut this out, that we further the discussion next year, and that we do not one of those gender things, but that we have another one that is longer. It was very clear that you want to stay and have 
have more to discuss here and that it maybe culminates in a series of workshops where actually people are connecting each other like if it's Chile or South Africa and people can do what you actually suggested, form coalitions, um, uh, form like a network of solidarity, but also support, financial support, and also filmmaking support, as you have all done with your projects, and have this like practically culminate into something else instead of just talking as we did and not, you know, maybe you are off to another movie and you don't have time for this lunch date or maybe we don't go to the same parties and so on and so forth, but maybe institutionalize this. Florian, I don't know if... <laughs> It's already there. Do you want? Okay. I'm not. I don't, I'm totally agreeing on this. I'm, this is this is actually the first session I was sitting through. So, and this is just from my personal point of view. So, because uh, I see this from the point of view of Berlinale Talents as a beginning. Uh, and uh, let me just briefly share this towards the end. Uh, the initial idea came from when we looked at uh, what kind of role models, idols you have in your applications. So because we, are, we asked for three people uh, that influence your work, artists, uh, mothers, fathers, whoever it is, um, and uh, out of 2,700 applications, three times, so around 8,000 potential names, we had 400 women among those. We have a 50-50 thing and I don't kind of, it's fine, it's also fine, I, I go with whatever you bring uh, to us and uh, there can be also a lot of uh, very inspiring men I think, but uh, we counted this and we can share this list, uh, hopefully I don't say something wrong, So, but we, we did a big homework because there's another layer and this is why I see this as a beginning and I'm super grateful for everything that happened here today uh, so that we can go on to also think about how we can uh, implement this into talents, because talking about workshops, talking about things, Berlinale Talents is supposed to be a 50-50 uh, uh, project, so we have 50-50 already, and now we can make this more visible, and also, hopefully, also in that suggestion, I like it, uh, more a topic, uh, and probably also think about how we can share this with others more uh, into the world. So from that point of view, no offense at all, uh, just the beginning. And uh, please, if you want to go out to the world, go also to us and influence talents in that way uh, as an initiative that is already there. Thank you, Florian Wickern, for making this possible, for initiating this. Isabel Schubert, Jocelyn Barnes, Winka Wiedemann, and Anna Serna, thank you so much, and thank you for your questions and your contributions, and uh, see you next year.